Thank you, Chris, and a good exhortation about prayer. Concern for the saints, well, that's really where we're going now in the book of Ephesians in chapter 4, this second half of the book. I'm going to look at verses 1 through 6 this morning. Ephesians 4, beginning with verse 1, therefore, I'll say something about that in the text, uh, in the sermon rather, that's, that connects us with everything that preceded. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. May the Lord bless this reading of his word, and may the Lord bless our time of study and reflection and worship in this hour. Let's pray. On the day the Constitution was adopted, and the delegates were leaving Independence Hall in Philadelphia, an anxious woman approached Benjamin Franklin and asked what they had decided. Would America be a republic or a monarchy? Mr. Franklin answered wisely, a republic if you can keep it. It was a reminder that preserving our national liberties requires the vigilance of citizens. Now, we've all heard that story. I don't know if it happened or if it happened in just that way, but the council is good. Citizens need to be informed and vigilant. And it's no less true for the vitality of the church. Paul gave similar counsel in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Preserve the unity. He even told the saints how to do it. It isn't easy. In fact, it's hard. Basically, it's done by loving the unlovely. That's stating the lesson of the passage very simply. It begins a new section of the book of Ephesians. The book divides neatly into two sections, chapters 1 through 3 and chapters 4 through 6. Chapters 1 through 3 are often designated as the doctrinal portion of the book, while chapters 4 through 6 are called the practical portion. That's how the older commentator Charles Ellicott identified chapters 4 through 6. I think that's misleading. It, It suggests that doctrine isn't practical. It is like a firm foundation is practical for the stability of a house or a skyscraper. Case in point, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It was built on unstable, an unstable foundation. A better description of the shift from the first half of the book to the second half of the book is from principle to practice or doctrine to duty, or creed to conduct. Each of those titles have been used by others. However we put it, our conduct is now the main focus of the book of Ephesians. And Paul indicated that change in verse 1. He wrote, Therefore, I entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling by which you have been called. The word therefore is important. It marks the transition in the book, and it indicates that the instruction he will give is based on his teaching on the doctrine of the previous chapters. 
He is saying, in effect, you have been redeemed by Christ. You've been reconciled into one body and you've made, been, and made into God's holy temple. Therefore, he says, walk in a manner worthy of all of that. Paul has given us doctrine to explain who we are as Christians and the great blessings that we have. In the rest of the book, he challenges us to walk according to them. Ah, but there's the rub. That's the problem. That's where the difficulty lies. It's so easy to teach doctrine much easier than to live out its implications. Easier to exhort others than to practice it ourselves. The Pharisees were notorious for that. Jesus called them hypocrites who laid heavy burdens on men's shoulders, but didn't move them with so much as a little finger. Paul was no hypocrite. He practiced what he preached and, and indicates that by the way he referred to himself. He, he didn't assert his authority as an apostle. He called himself the prisoner of Christ. And that's interesting because in chapter 1, verse 1, he begins the first half of the book, Paul, an apostle of Christ. And here he begins the second half of the book, I, the prisoner of the Lord. And that really is a badge of honor and one here of authority. He was no armchair theologian. He lived the life. He not only studied the Word of God to know it with precision, he also carried the Gospel to people and helped them into the right life. He was, to borrow a phrase, a man of the cloister and of the open road. He was Christ's great missionary. And armed with the truth, he took to the highways across the empire and preached in synagogues and in marketplaces. And he paid the price more than any of us have, suffering beatings and stonings, dangers of all kinds and imprisonments. As a result of obedience, living the life, he was now a prisoner in a Roman jail. But he didn't call himself the prisoner of Nero, but the prisoner of the Lord. In the Greek text, it is literally the prisoner in the Lord, which indicates his union and his vital communion with the Lord. His life was consistent. He practiced what he preached. But he also preached and spoke and wrote out of the authority of Christ in whom he was united in a real vital relationship. That's his authority. So he instructed us to walk. Very common word in the Bible for live. Enoch walked with God 300 years and he was not for God took him. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, whose life doesn't follow the course of their evil counsel. Walking is not only living, it implies progress toward an end or goal, goal either good or bad. Jeremiah urged Israel to walk in the ancient paths and find peace for their souls and rest for their souls, but they would not. Saints are always to be progressing toward holiness, progressing toward Christ-likeness. We never reach the end in this life. We, we are always to be advancing toward it as one walking along God's path, those ancient paths. And our walk is to be in a manner worthy of the calling. The calling is all of grace, unmerited favor. God did not choose and call us based on some good deed that we have done or based on some level of merit that we have achieved. No, just the opposite. And Paul reminded the Ephesians of that earlier. 
They were dead, spiritually unworthy and unable when God called them out of death into life. That's something we need to emphasize. Death. It's something that, that caused uncleanness in the Old Covenant. A person would accidentally come across a, a grave that was unmarked. They might touch a bone. They were unclean. They had to go outside the camp. It made them unworthy. We're unable as well because we go back to, to uh, the Old Testament in, in Ezekiel 37 and that magnificent passage about the valley of dry bones filled with this multitude of dry bones and, and Ezekiel calls them very dry. And they didn't live until God's Spirit breathed upon them and brought them to life. That's true of us. That's a, a prophecy of Israel, but it's true of every one of us who've been brought to faith. We can't minimize this word death. And we can't, we, we can't we, we minimize it to our own, our own uh, detriment. Now that ought to cause something in us. Not resentment, but it ought to cause in us a sense of humility. We've earned nothing. We've received everything. And in verse 2, that is the first step that Paul gives in our walk that is worthy of our calling. And that's an essential first step in order to achieve the goal of our walk given in verse 3, which is unity. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That starts with all humility. Now in spite of the lessons, this lessons, this sermon's title, not all Christians are unlovely. Most are the loveliest people in the world. But sometimes all of us have a bad day or days and fail to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. I plead guilty. I am the starting linebacker on that team. <laughs> captain of the team. And that can put a strain on relationships. How do we deal with such situations? Well, Paul explains it here. But it begins not so much with an act as an attitude. Walk with all humility. As I said that's the first step, but it's a difficult step to take or attitude to embrace because it calls for us to think and act in a way that really is contrary to human nature. Contrary to fallen human nature, I must say, because we've been given a new heart and new abilities. But nevertheless, that sin that's still within us makes this very difficult, makes it a, an unnatural thing. Man, by nature, in his fallen nature, seeks his own advantage, promotes and protects himself. And so Paul was urging what was, for many, for all, I would say, unnatural. In fact, among the Greeks, humility was a vice, not a virtue. A, a weakness associated with the attitude of a slave. And that was the culture of the Ephesians. They lived in that mindset. And yet Paul said, we are to be humble. We are to have the same attitude that Christ had. That was the counsel he gave to the Philippians. Christ humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. We are not to seek our own interests first. We are to seek the interests of others. We are to act from, not to act from selfishness, but selflessness. We are to be humble. We're to walk with humility. And Paul adds to that gentleness. That's the second step in a walk for unity. Gentleness or meekness as the King James Version puts it. It is the meek who the Lord said will inherit the earth. Meekness is not weakness or spinelessness. Not in the Bible, at least. Moses is called the meekest man on the face of the earth. 
But he stood face to face with Pharaoh, governed the rebellious Israelites for 40 years in the harsh desert. That's strength. Jesus said, I am gentle and humble in heart. But clearly, he was not a weak individual. He cleared out the temple twice, once with a scourge of cords. No man has ever had the strength of character and courage of our Lord. He was meek or gentle. The Greeks applied the, the word gentleness to uh, animals whose strength had been brought under control as with a strong horse that is easy to manage. Paul used the word here in that way with the sense of, of power under control. It is disciplined submission. That doesn't mean that we, we, we shouldn't stand up for our rights or for what is right. Paul did that when he was mistreated in Philippi. He informed the authorities that he and Silas were both Roman citizens and their rights had been violated. They demanded a public apology and they got it. Gentleness doesn't ignore truth and justice and what is right. But neither does it retaliate. It forgives. It is controlled strength. That's, and that leads to, into the third and the fourth steps in a, a walk worthy of the Lord's calling of grace. They are the words patience and tolerance. Patience has to do with not uh, taking vengeance for a wrong suffered, and tolerance involves bearing with one another's weakness and failure, which we all have, all of us. We're dust. We're weak. And that's true. So Paul lists four steps in this walk of faith. It is with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another. And then he added to that, in love, which encompasses all four. Love is the greatest virtue. It is the highest good. It doesn't seek its own, doesn't get jealous, isn't arrogant. Paul describes it fully and clearly in 1 Corinthians 13. Love seeks the welfare of the church, even at cost to self, because love is selfless. But again, it's one thing to preach it, and it's another thing to practice it. And Paul knew that. He was realistic. We all have different personalities and foibles that can... Uh, Maybe we're not aware of, but others are, and things that can annoy others. In the screw tape letters, the master demon tells his young apprentice to distract a new convert while he is in church from the sermon to the people in the pew next to him. Maybe uh, the person next to him sings out of tune, and that's probably me that... Uh, you might uh, be thinking of, or someone whose boots squeak, or one who wears odd clothes. But these eccentricities can make him, this young Christian, think that Christianity is somehow odd or ridiculous. Well, I, I suppose we all have some oddities as well as shortcomings and worse, they can all affect us, they can annoy, they can, can, can anger others, they can anger us. Uh, sometimes the saints let us down. The temptation is to dismiss them, dismiss him or her, reject that person. Paul says, no, you must bear each other's weaknesses. You, you have to put the, the saints ahead of self. That's love. It's the outworking of the doctrines Paul taught in the previous chapters, which we could summarize as grace. Since God has forgiven our sins, taken us into His family, 
We who were formerly sons of disobedience, shouldn't we be patient with others who fail and fall? Of course. It's not easy. Still, that's the worthy walk. It begins with humility. It results in unity. That's what Paul urges in verse 3. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now you'll notice we don't create unity. It already exists. Paul says preserve the unity. It's kind of like a republic if you can keep it. We are to preserve what Christ has created and given us. That's what Paul taught in chapter 2, verse 14. Christ has unified us. He Himself being our peace who made both groups into one. Jews and Gentiles into one new man. And we are now responsible to preserve that unity. And there's an urgency in, in Paul's appeal here. Be diligent, he said. Make haste. Make it a priority. It calls for effort on our part. And the condition for unity is peace, which comes from love. There are, are so many differences uh, among us that can cause annoyance or can, can spark conflict. But love seeks to establish peace. The Lord said, blessed are the peacemakers. Peace is the, the bond that holds things together. Peace results in unity. And unity is a testimony to God's grace and to Christ, the Prince of Peace. In, in a world of conflict among nations, broadly, and even within homes particularly, the world sees God's grace in the changed lives of the church, a place of peace. So God is to be glorified in the church. That's what Paul said at the end of the first section in verse 21 of chapter 3, to Him be the glory in the church. Glorified as our love is turned toward one another and we bear up with each other. We, we seek the best for one another. We do that with humility and patience, which should be turned outward to the world as well. Paul wrote that to the Romans. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. That's a true testimony of the grace of God. But first, the world should see the bond of peace in the church. That's Paul's first concern, the church. As God's household, His temple, we are to be unified. Paul then demonstrated the unity we have with a brief doctrinal statement in verses 4 through 6, so we don't completely get away from doctrine ever. And that gives the basis for maintaining this peace and this unity. He lists seven spiritual facts that unite us as believers. Three of the seven are the persons of the Godhead. The other four are Christian experiences related to each person of the Trinity. And to each person and experience, he attached the word one. So seven times Paul repeats the word one. It runs throughout the whole section laying special emphasis on our oneness, on our unity. The first three spiritual facts are listed in verse 4 where Paul features the person of the Holy Spirit. There's one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. So first there is one body, one church. There are, not many, there are many members, all kinds of people, Jew and Gentile, male and female. That was the case when he was writing this letter, but today there are people from all different countries and continents in the church. 
Just look around. The, the church is not monochromatic. It's variegated. It, it, it has many colors, like a, a magnificent tapestry with colors and intricate shapes and figures. It's an exciting place. It should be. But all kinds of people has the potential to split the body into all kinds of churches. In Paul's day, the potential was to split the church into the Jewish churches and the Gentile churches. But there is only one church, one body, Paul says. So we are to maintain our unity. We are to, to function with the coordination of a physical body. We are to work together in harmony. We're, we're to do that in the local church. This church is to function in that way. But Paul is describing here the universal church. That's indicated by one body. So we are to see ourselves as unified with believers all over the world and, and receive them as part of the one body. And what makes that possible is the Holy Spirit. The one Spirit. He is the life of the body. He provides us with love, the fruit of the Spirit. It's not something we generate, though we do act on it, we do produce it, but we only do that because it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's what He produces. He promotes, He provides unity within each member of the body. Now, that is the, the power that makes unity more than a possibility. It ensures the actuality of it. As difficult as it may be, we have power within that is of God. We are bound together by the Holy Spirit. He has called us into one body, called each of us to one hope, we all share the same future, which is the resurrection to come, the kingdom to come, the world to come, an eternal inheritance, world without end. And so we should live together in that hope. We should work together and minister together toward that common hope. As Dr. Johnson used to say, we're all going to spend eternity together, so we should be getting along together now. In verse 5, the emphasis shifts from the Spirit of God, um, or rather, from the Spirit of God to the Son of God. He is our Lord. Throughout the Roman Empire, the word Lord was in common use before this letter was written, and it was used for the many gods that were worshipped. Nero was called Lord of all the world. And emperor worship was common throughout the empire. But Christ is the only Lord, the only object of faith, the only Savior, the only God-man who is to be honored and obeyed as Lord. And that, too, is proof of our unity. That we all recognize Christ as Lord, as God and Savior. And those, in, in those early years of the church, many, many Christians suffered and died together in unity because they refused to confess Caesar as Lord. One Lord, Paul wrote, one faith, one baptism. One faith could refer to the one body of doctrine that we have, the 66 books of the Bible, or and what was unfolding at that time as the apostles were writing. But more likely, it refers to one act of believing. In other words, only one way of salvation through faith alone in Christ alone. Unity must be in that. There's no unity outside of that great doctrine. So Paul could write in the book of Galatians that there is only one gospel. Anyone who preaches faith plus circumcision, which was the issue when that book was written, or faith plus ceremonies of any kind, or faith plus works of any kind, preaches a different gospel. And another gospel, which is not a gospel at all. And to that, Paul added most seriously, 
He is, whoever does it, man or angel, he is to be accursed, anathema, damned. Here he says there is one faith and one baptism. When we believed at that moment, we were baptized into Christ. This isn't water baptism. Paul isn't writing of the ordinances of the church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. This is spiritual baptism. Baptism into Christ, which Paul writes in other places, such as Galatians uh, 3, verse 27, all of you who were baptized into Christ have, been, have clothed yourselves with Christ. As a result of that, he wrote, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now there are Jews and there are Greeks and there are male and there are females and, and all, but we are, we are all on the same footing same ground. We are united and equal before the Lord. That's the ground of our unity, being baptized into Christ. So at the moment of faith, we were baptized into, placed in the body of Christ and made members of His church. In verse 6, it's our unity with the Father that Paul extols. There is one God, he writes, and He is Father of all. He created the church. Made us into one family. And He caused every believer, he care, I should say, He cares for each believer equally. Like a father. That's an amazing thought. He cares for you as much as He did for the Apostle Paul. He cares for you as much as He did for Augustine or the great reformers, or the great missionaries. Go down the list of great men and women who have served the Lord. He cares for you just as much as He cares for them. You are equally His Father. He is equally your Father. He is over all, Paul said, and through all and in all. He is sovereign. Absolutely sovereign, omnipotent, and omnipresent. Well, that's... that's the work of the one God, the triune God, the Trinity. The Father creates the one family. The Son saves the one family. The Spirit draws and unites the one family. So, we are to stay one. We are to stay united. Now this is, this is not a, a call for ecumenicity for denominations to unite into one world church. There can only be unity in these central truths. There's no unity outside of the purity of the gospel. There's no unity outside of any of these truths that Paul has mentioned. And that, that clearly is what Paul is saying. He was not saying unite. He was saying Christians are already united in these truths, in the doctrine of the Trinity, in the doctrine of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, not works. That's chapter 2, verse 8. Those are the truths that define the family of God. In fact, in, in 1 John, the apostle called those who deny those truths antichrist. They went out from us, he said, but they were not really of us. We have no fellowship with those who deny the Father and the Son or the Spirit. What Paul is calling for is the practice of love and unity among genuine believers. In that way, God is glorified in the church. He's not glorified in disunity not glorified in a lack of brotherly love. Years ago, I, I read a story in the Wall Street Journal that was a bit humorous about two brothers, Ed and Bernie. One was chief executive of Sears, 
and the other of Montgomery Ward and Company. The, the article told of their rise to the top, a, a story it said was without precedent in business, and yet went on to say it's also a bit weird. Despite walk, uh, working a mile apart, they rarely got together. No one was quite sure they liked each other. There was rivalry between them. As a result, a, an unfounded rumor circulated that they might actually be half-brothers. Well, the, truth, the, the church can resemble that. It has all kinds of people from all walks of life, each of us with different levels of understanding and maturity. There are Arminians. I hate to say that. <laughs> but it's true. There are Arminians and there are Calvinists and there are Emeraldians, four-point Calvinists. But where we agree in the fundamentals of the truth, uh, just stated in this book, where we agree in the Trinity, the deity of Christ, and faith alone in Him and His sacrifice as the only way of salvation, that makes us all brothers, not half-brothers. Rivalry has no place in that relationship. The Lord has bound us together in a relationship that is challenging. It'll always be challenging, this side of glory. It requires humility on our part, tolerance and kindness, and that that is a test that the Lord gives us all. And it's difficult. That's our situation. Now, we're to be tolerant, as I say. We're to be patient. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean be accepting of error. We cannot be accepting of error. But we can be disagreeing in brotherly love and gentle correction. Look, we, we all are debtors to mercy alone. We are all debtors to God's grace we who know the truth only know it by the sovereign grace of God. And, and all in Christ, regardless of maturity, are serving the King of Kings. Leon Morris told a story about a visitor to the site of St. Paul's Cathedral in London designed by the great architect Christopher Wren who built 52 churches in London alone. Well, the visitor spoke to the workmen there. This is as the building is being constructed. <clears throat> and he asked uh, one what he was doing, and the man answered, I'm shaping this piece of stone. He put the question to another. I'm earning my pay. And then he asked the third who responded, I'm helping Sir Christopher Wren build a cathedral. All of those answers were true, but the third answer showed that the man working, the man, the third showed the man worked with vision. He worked with purpose. He worked with joy. His service was done with the great architect. That's true of every Christian. We are partners in the greatest enterprise in the universe, building the church with the great architect. That should unite us in a common work and walk together worthy of the calling. But to walk in a manner worthy of the calling, you must know that you have been called and you can only know that by believing the gospel of Christ. That He is God's Son and our Savior. Only those who recognize their sin, that they are dead in sin and trespasses, and have put their faith, only their faith, in Christ alone for salvation, can know that they are saved, and that they belong to Christ, and that they are in His body. So, if you've not done that, turn to Him and live. He gives forgiveness. He gives life that's forever, eternal life. 
May God help you to do that and help all of us to understand the great truths that characterize us and live according to the implications of those great doctrines and truths. Love one another and serve with one another. Well, let's stand and sing number 22 in the Songs of Praise book, O Great God, and then remain standing for the benediction. Number 22 in the Songs of Praise. Lord, that should be our prayer, and it is our prayer that you would be glorified through us in all that we do, all that we say, all that we think. Well, that will never be completely true of us until we are in your presence and in glory, but that's the path we're on, and that's the goal we should seek. And every child of God does that, has that desire, and seeks to do that. May that be seen more so increasingly in each of us, that we would serve you. We are debtors to mercy alone. We are debtors to your sovereign grace. You've given us everything for all eternity in this brief life that you've given us. May we seek earnestly to serve you and be a blessing to one another. These are the things we pray in Christ's name. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.